We've witnessed significant developments in the last few days in the Middle East, with the latest being the assassination, most probably by Israel, of the political leader of Hamas in the diaspora, at the political bureau based in Qatar, Ismail Haniyeh. This and other events will certainly curtail diplomatic efforts that have been led by the United States with its various allies in the region, mainly Qatar and Egypt being the two brokers, to bring the conflict to an end, to de-escalate tensions, and most importantly, to uh, return the hostages and, um, and have a ceasefire put in place in Gaza. However, against these geopolitical developments uh, and shifting dynamics that are very, very rapid on the ground are also other developments in the international legal arena concerning this conflict that most recently took place a few weeks ago with the top UN court, the International Court of Justice, ruling that Israel's 57-year occupation of the Palestinian territories is unlawful and pointing to the continuous expansion of illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, as well as the practice of discriminatory policies against Palestinians. Further, in May of this year, more than seven months after the Hamas October 7th attacks on Israel, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court announced that he's seeking arrest warrants for the leaders of both Israel and Hamas, designated, of course, a terrorist organization here in the United States, as well as across the world, on charges of crimes against humanity. This was seen by many as a very controversial move that was rebuked strongly by the Biden administration, but also backed by the European Union, as well as other key US allies in Europe and in the Middle East. So to discuss the legal dimension, the international legal dimension of the ongoing war in Gaza since the Hamas attacks in October, I speak today with Professor Eric Schwartz, who is a former Wilson Center Public Policy Fellow and currently Chair of the Humphrey School of Global Policy and formerly President of Refugees International. Professor Schwartz, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And and only because it's relevant uh, to our conversation. You know, I dealt with a lot of these issues in another incarnation when I was on the staff of the National Security Council in the Clinton administration and and Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Population, Refugees and Migration during the administration of uh, President Obama. So all of these issues uh, have uh, legal a humanit international humanitarian and political aspects. And they all uh, play out in a broad political context, uh, which is why uh, your opening comments, I think, were so very significant. I think we should be careful not to underestimate the significance of uh, the killing of um, uh, Ismail Haniyeh, uh, 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 you know, the uh, political head of Hamas who was who was killed uh, in Iran. Um, I think that is uh, far more politically significant. A death is a death, but far more politically significant uh, than the uh, than the death of Fuad uh, uh, Shukar, the, um, uh, the Hezbollah uh, um, in uh, Lebanon. Yeah, in Lebanon. Uh, but I think this this uh, this action against this Hamas leader. Um, uh, is it, it makes me very concerned. It's it's it 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 raises questions about what the government of Israel really seeks uh, over the next several weeks and months uh, in these negotiations, uh, because after all, uh, um, the Hamas official who was killed was a key, maybe the key interlocutor on the Hamas side. So I think that issue is going to is going to play out initially over the next several days but perhaps even longer and i think it could have um really significant and substantial impacts on on um the process of these ceasefire discussions so having said that and i i because I, I just i think it's just too important not to focus on um we can talk about um 
the international legal uh, dimensions. And maybe the easiest way for me to do this is to sort of, uh, for people who have some connection to these issues, but, you know, but don't really understand or don't have an appreciation of all the different legal institutions and dimensions that are playing out, maybe I can just provide a very brief summary, if that would be of help. I think I think that would be extremely helpful. Those are two very significant decisions by the ICJ and the ICC. I think there is also sometimes some confusion as to the difference between the ICC and the ICJ. Uh, but we can uh, hear you talk about perhaps these two significant decisions, um, and then we can discuss later how these decisions, if any. Um, actually impact the geopolitical dimensions uh, of this conflict uh, that you talked about also earlier. So back over to you, Professor. Okay, Schultz. well, I'll start with the ICJ, and uh, also known as the International Court of Justice. And I'm going to add uh, a case that you didn't mention, uh, the ICJ uh, 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 action brought by South Africa under the Genocide Convention. Okay, mm -hmm. but let's put that aside for a second. So the, the, the International Court of Justice is really a successor institution to what was known as the Permanent Court of International Justice under the League of, uh, uh, League of Nations. Uh, so, and um, the IC, ICJ was established in 1946, I believe. I think the Permanent Court, its predecessor, probably about 20, uh, 25 years earlier than that. And the ICJ has a statute, and it is all about uh, resolving uh, disputes between nations, between uh, nation states, essentially. Um, and so it does not involve individuals, it involves states. And, um, and uh, there are lots of different ways you can be subject to the jurisdiction of the ICJ. What that means is there are lots of different ways the ICJ can say, we can talk about this. We can we can reach a judgment on it, um, and um, one of those ways uh, is a referral, uh, a, a request for an advisory opinion from the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly. So that the first case that you're talking about resulted from a um, uh, a request from the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, for the ICJ to comment on the, um, the legal issues surrounding uh, the, uh, um, the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, and in particular, the occupation. Right? And essentially, the ICJ, uh, the decision based on this request from the General Assembly was that uh, the, the settlements and the annexation uh, of certain parts of um, the occupied territories, because Israel has not declared that it has annexed all of the occupied territories, but certain parts, including um, uh, um, uh, East Jerusalem, that, 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 that these actions are unlawful and that the international community and the United Nations and member states you know, should take action pursuant to um, uh, that judgment and, and um, you know, designed to encourage uh, the government of Israel, um, you know, to change its laws, to reverse its policies, to make, um, uh, you know, uh, compensation, a, a range of elements in this decision. Now, the principle, so that would, that's one decision. I, I'm going to talk about the second ICJ uh, decision, which is a, a ICJ action, which is separate from this, um, because then I'll talk about the political impact. Um, or maybe I'll, well, let me talk about the second ICJ uh, um, uh, action. And this was uh, an action brought by South Africa under, uh, uh, in December of 2023, uh, uh, relating to, you know, um, a genocide, uh, accusations of genocide. Now, what is genocide? It's a good question because we use the term a lot, but what is genocide? Genocide is defined under international, uh, under international human uh, law as, you know, heinous acts like killing, limiting births, forcible transfer, and here's the key, with the intent to destroy, quote, in part or whole of a population, uh, in part or whole, a population due to their ethnic, racial, or racial identity. 
or national identity. That's how we define uh, genocide. Now, South Africa brought this action. Is, uh, is uh, to my knowledge, you know, Israel under the ICJ has not consented to the automatic um, uh, jurisdiction of the ICJ. So the question is, on what basis can South Africa bring this action? against Israel? And it's a good question. And the answer is under the uh, several conventions, including the Genocide Convention, have a provision uh, in which it says if there's a dispute under this convention, you know, states uh, can bring uh, actions through the ICJ. And both Israel and South Africa are parties to the Genocide Convention without reservations. And so it's, that is the basis of the South African action. And the ICJ and, 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 the, and, and that, that case is, is, is ongoing. But the ICJ has issued some provisional rulings, you know, a, 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 um, uh, uh, um, provisional measures, which are designed to say, okay, we haven't decided anything significant yet, but you need to be careful. And one, a couple of those uh, provisional rulings said, you know, you've got to, you know, make sure that you refrain from measures that would violate the Genocide Convention. But a significant provisional uh, ruling they made was in May and of, of this year, in which they said, I'm going to quote, so I'm going to read it. It says, that the the Israeli uh, the, uh, um, the military must immediately halt its military offensive, comma, and any other action in the Rafah governor governorate, comma, which may inflict on the Palestinian group in Gaza conditions of life that could bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Now, many, I think, many people saw that as a directive from the ICJ to cease. Um, the offensive in Rafa, and the key word for those of us who are, you know, you know, think about grammar, and I think most of us do, is the term, you know, which they say cease these actions, comma, which may inflict on the Palestinian group in Gaza conditions of life that could bring about uh, their physical destruction, and so that use of the word which suggests, at least for an English language speaker, that. The court is saying all of these actions could inflict, or um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, on the Palestinian group actions that could bring about their physical destruction. So, if you read it that way, you see it as a as a, as a directive to halt the military offensive. Of course, the government of Israel did not halt the offensive, and there's some disagreement on on interpretation of that language. Um, and uh, so those are the two ICJ opinions. Mm -hmm. And um, and before I go to the International Criminal Court, which is a different animal, you know, the question is, what is their significance? And since we don't yes. have two hours to talk about this, I'm going to really talk about what I think is most significant, which is, is the, you know, these legal judgments or legal processes, um, you know, uh, create, legitimize a very high degree of scrutiny over the actions of, um, of, of the government of Israel uh, in Gaza. It sort of legitimizes it, and it does create political uh, pressures, which could also be translated into international, you know, uh, declarations and measures and influence the behavior of national governments, including the government of the United States. So they're, they're part of a, if I can use this term, sort of an ecosystem of political and legal measures that, that have an influence over the process. And they are not, to my mind, they're not insignificant. They're very significant. And I think, and I think you know, in principle, they're also important because uh, they, they, they give credence to concerns that many of the actions in, um, in Gaza um, conducted by uh, the, the Israeli military, um, you know, raise very serious concerns about uh, respect for international human rights and humanitarian law. And I think that, so I think these measures have had, a, have had an impact on the overall view 
of what the government of Israel and what the military is doing. And I think that's, you know, and I think for, for, for advocates of human rights and humanitarian law, um, I think that is a very, and myself included, I think that's a very valuable, um, you know, and that's a very valuable effect. Now, let me just move to the ICC, if I may. Yes. Um, and so the ICC is a different animal, um, uh, but it sort of is part of this ecosystem um, mm -hmm. uh, because the ICC is, um, is an institution, the International Criminal Court, established by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which is a treaty. Uh, which was adopted, mm, oh goodness, uh, you probably can Google it, around 2000, uh, between 1998 and 2002. I think it came into effect in 2002, but all of those numbers, you know, may be a little bit off. So it's it's been around for about 20, 20 years. Um, and the ICC, um, uh, which the United States, the ICC Treaty, which the United States has signed, but has not ratified, um, but most of the governments of the world have ratified, um, is an international criminal court that, that is not a court that adjudicates disputes between states, but rather a court that, um, that uh, adjudicates, um, you, know, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, crimes uh, 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 international humanita of international humanitarian and human rights law that are perpetrated by individuals and mm -hmm. and the theory of the court is if uh, uh, if the, a national government has the willingness and the capacity to prosecute crimes in their own territory or on their own territory um then the icc doesn't need to be involved so the icc gets involved the international criminal court gets involved is supposed to get involved when a, a particular country is unwilling or unable to prosecute war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and um, and also the crime of aggression, and and in May of this year, the ICC prosecutor uh, Karim Khan requested of a pretrial chamber in the court. Requested mm -hmm. indictments for war crimes and crimes against humanity um, uh, um, uh, against uh, five individuals. Yes. Um, and but before I tell you what who the individuals were, I should tell you you know what's a war crime? What is a war crime? Mm -hmm. You know, a war crime is a breach of the Geneva Convention, which were conventions mm -hmm. and uh, you know, uh, uh, um, adopted about 70 years ago, um, 70, 75 years ago, uh, relating to the rules uh, and laws of warfare. Uh, and the laws of warfare, you know, accept the fact that war can be very ugly, mm -hmm. uh, but there are certain kinds of practices and principles that you have to engage in Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, you know, that, that, that reflect how you conduct war, warfare and how you treat civilians in the context mm -hmm. of warfare. Mm -hmm. Civilians mm -hmm. die in war, and, mm -hmm. and that's a tragedy, but there are certain actions that you uh, can't take. You can't torture civilians. Um, you can't, you know, uh, take in, you know, uh, launch indiscriminate attacks that are designed to kill everybody in a particular, in a large area hundreds if not thousands of people if you're trying to just get at one person your your efforts yeah. you have to be your your military efforts um have to justify any any civilian uh, uh killing that results so the war mm -hmm. crimes include breaches of the geneva convention or what's known as customary laws of war torture willful killing of civilians destruction of property not not justified by military necessity and Crimes against humanity are really heinous acts that are part of a, quote, widespread and systematic attack directed against any civilian population. So those were the category of crimes that the ICC prosecutor requested indictments for and against, in one case, Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and the Defense yeah. Minister of Israel, Yoav Gallant. Mm -hmm. And three um, uh, 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 um, uh, Palestinians, the political head of Hamas, 
who was who was killed assassinated uh, yeah, yeah. Who's, who, yeah exactly um that's uh, ismail hania and then the the political head of gaza in gaza uh, yaya simwar and then the military head of uh, uh um, of, 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 of of hamas i'm sorry of hamas uh ibrahim al masri known as uh, i think it's pronounced deef um, and um those cases now are before a pretrial chamber which will decide whether an indict in the court which will decide whether an indictment will be issued and uh, in a very significant action over the last couple of days the government the new government of the united kingdom withdrew what had been an objection to this indictment which it had submitted mm -hmm. to the court and the, the the government of the uk the new labor government of the uk said look the court will make its own decision you know and uh, you know and and that's that and again this is part of the you know the the sort of the, the politics the political ecosystem in which these these institutes i don't want to say the, i'm not saying that the court is politicized i'm sure. not saying that some mm -hmm. people would say it i'm not saying it what i am saying is that these courts operate in a broader uh, um, uh, context. Your political context, of course. Yeah. And, 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 um, and, and so, for example, if the pretrial chamber uh, determines an indictment is justified, those who are indicted will have to think twice or three times before they travel internationally, because the 120 or 125 or so members of the International Criminal Court will have an obligation uh, to assist the court in um, in bringing uh, uh, those who are indicted, you know, into custody, and uh, those indictments haven't been issued, but they may, and so all of this is part of uh, of 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 the use of international human rights and humanitarian law and these institutions to improve, you know, the behavior of states and the behavior of individuals and that is indeed part of a much larger political ecosystem and 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 what do we expect moving forward um we as you mentioned uh, you still have um basically a timeline set for uh for the icc for example for these arrest warrants so what is it that we know that we can expect in the near future um, and what do we watch out for um, concerning both the ICJ as well as the ICC? Yeah, I mean, I think in the context of everything I've just said, um, I think in the ICC case, I think, you know, decisions of the, uh, of the pretrial chamber and a decision on an indictment will be hugely uh, significant. Uh, I don't know what the timeline for that is. Um, I think the British action over the last couple of days withdrawing their objection is, is not is not trivial. I think that's very significant. Mm -hmm. And I think if there is an indictment, I think that that will be a major event. Um, and, um, and and there will be people that there, there, there will be pressure for governments uh, to um, help the court execute that indictment, and um, and and, and um, um, there will be um, um, there will be loud pro if the indictment does take place, there will be loud protestations, um, uh, you know, from those who are indicted. Uh, but that will again raise the salience of the issue of of what's going on uh, in Gaza, and and. Um, and so I think that's the next big event on the ICC. Uh, with respect to the ICJ, I think the ICJ decision um, is significant because, uh, and I'm not going to get into the details of this because it's it's too complicated, and it also will go beyond the 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 the, the breadth of my understanding. But but in fact, the 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 position of the Israeli government was that the the um, the territory the occupied territories. Um, were um you know they, they they were arguing that the law of belligerent occupation um they were they were applying it in the occupied territories but they weren't required to apply it. that that's been a long-standing israeli position and the icj has basically said no that's not the case and so you're so so there are particular remedies that the icj has recommended in this decision and I think you know you will see political efforts to pursue and to promote 
um, those kinds of remedies, which will now have a greater degree of legitimacy. You may see, for example, a greater effort uh, to encourage Western governments uh, to impose, uh, you know, to impose uh, sanctions measures on activities that are um, that 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 are either taking place in the occupied t territories or mm -hmm. that are taking place and strengthen the position of the occupiers and you may mm -hmm. see increased pressure on there so i think the icj has sort of in its in its recommended measures in this advisory opinion they kind of have provided a to-do list uh for mm -hmm. for advocates mm -hmm. uh you know uh of uh, or, or those who are opposed to the Israeli position and in favor of, of, of where the ICJ is on this. In terms of the the IC the 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 uh, you know the genocide um, uh, um, uh, case, um, I think that case is going to play out over probably over a couple of few years at least. Yeah. Um, but I do I do think there may be other provisional measures when when this provisional measure on Rafa was um was uh, uh declared by the um by the uh, um, by the icj um uh it had a lot of salience it it, it, it didn't it didn't prevent the, the you know action in rafa but it had a lot of political salience and you may see um south africa or um you know make additional requests for provisional measures um and that may have some uh, some impact i um you know, uh, the, the genocide accusation against the government of, of Israel has is, is particularly uh, has been, you know, sort of has particularly been particularly irksome. And I think that says it mildly, uh, you know, to the government of Israel, because, of course, the Jewish people themselves were um, were, were, were persecuted were subject to a, mm -hmm. a horrendous genocide of the Holocaust, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, at the same time, um, uh, and 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 I'll, I'll be frank with you. I have some, I have more than a little sympathy for that perspective. On the other hand, if you look at the um, if you look at the, um, uh, the statements of the most sort of virulent um, officials in Israel, um, you know you 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 really have to say what are they really advocating in terms of um uh, the future of uh of the palestinian people uh in occupied uh in in in, in occupied uh israel so um uh, but that that has been a very politically charged um uh, uh, uh set of accusations because of the history of um of the jewish people and 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 how yeah. Um, the Holocaust has affected um, um, all Jews, including myself. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Schwartz, thank you very much for shedding light on these very complex issues. Uh, and as you mentioned, none of these um, legalities exist in a vacuum. Uh, there's a geopolitical context, um, as I described in my introduction, that is rapidly changing um, and uh, also changing the dynamics on the ground. Um, so thank you again, and we hope to continue the discussion um, in the near future um, as we see further developments unfold. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you.